<laughs> How old do you have to be to drive? A mommy. A mommy? Um, 18 and 81. Maybe like um, 10, 15, 12, um, 65. Uh, does your mom drive? Yes. Is she 65? Um, maybe. She'll be delighted to hear that. How old do you have to be to drive a car? Um, 58. Yeah. What about 48? Is that old enough, do you think? What about 38? Do you think it's old enough to drive? What about 68? 68 is good too, yeah. What about 78? What about 88? 88's good, but then there's always 98. But there has to be 10-D-8. 10 d 8 10 d 8 might even be too old to drive. <laughs> What would you do if you had a million dollars? I would buy a flat screen TV. That's it? And a mansion. I would buy um, um, like a fun house with bouncy houses and all those fun things in one house. You'd buy a bouncy house? Would you live in it? Yeah, and it'll be jello inside. What would you do if you had a million dollars? Cash. Donate half to charity and um, donate the rest to people do who don't have money or clothes. So half to charity. Yeah. And half to people who don't have money and clothes. Well, I'd save a little bit of money for me, but. To do what with? Uh, like buy food for myself, maybe my kids. You have kids? How old are they? No, I buy food for my kids and my wife and me. What's your wife's name? Really? Oh, that's a pretty name. How did you meet, really? I don't have kids. You or a have... wife. So you were lying about the wife. What? You were lying when you told me you had a wife? Well, you asked me a question that I... What? You lied. Really? Oh, are you calling for your wife? No! Well, you just said really. You're a funny guy. <laughs> really? Yeah. Tell her I said hello. Hey. Well, I think it's fun for all of us to think about what we would do with a million dollars. Last week I talked about the fact that states have put up guardrails on roads, dangerous parts of roads all over the United States. Uh, if you hit a guardrail, you hurt your car, but it protects you from facing Sure disaster. And then I talked about what about if we put up guardrails in other areas of our lives that are maybe far more dangerous for our lives. What about money? And so we began to look at guardrails Jesus suggests for use of money. Jesus talks a lot about money. Why does he talk about money so much? It's because he realizes that money is his chief competition. Uh, we noted three guardrails that he suggested last week. One is watch out for greed. And one way to measure greed might be your level of debt. Two is watch out for pride. Becoming proud of what you've earned and, you know, that you can take care of yourself. And then three, the important thing with money is to be rich toward God. Now, today I want to look at a conversation Jesus had with a rich man. It's in Luke 18, 18 to 30. You can turn to it. We have Bibles in the seats in front of you. In verse 24 and 25, Jesus looked at him <clears throat> and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What does he mean? So I want to ask two questions of Jesus. Does wealth keep us from God? And... Is it possible to be rich and be a devoted follower of Christ? So, does wealth keep us from God? The context is verse 15. People were coming and bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. 
When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Hey, Jesus doesn't have time for babies and kids. Stop it. But Jesus said, called the children and said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. He said, children are the way you come to know me by having an attitude of trusting and dependence. And then Luke goes right into this story of this rich man. I think he wants to notice the contrast. This rich man is bright. He's a man with promise. He's climbing quickly up the corporate rat ladder. He undoubtedly graduated with honors. He's a mover and shaker. He was voted, my, my guess, most likely to succeed in high school. He's the envy of all who know him. And he's interested in knowing God. Verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's tried to be good, but he senses something may be missing. He has a lingering suspicion that he still has something more he needs to do. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God. Uh, Jesus is not saying he's not good. He's not saying he doesn't deserve to be called good teacher. He's not denying that he's the son of God. He's simply probing this man. Why do you call me good? Does that mean you know that I'm the son of God? You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. The young man senses that he's still missing something. The commands that Jesus cites are all from the second half of the Ten Commandments. They all have to do with our relationship with other people. This guy senses he's done pretty good with people. But Jesus sees where he falls short, his relationship with God. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Jesus saw that God wasn't first in his life. His money was more important to him than God. God insists on being first in our lives. Not that God is needy. It's because he made us to depend on him. We need to make God first in our lives. We are to depend on God. God's an all or nothing God. We have no record of Jesus making this request of anybody else. So this is unique to this man. When he heard this, the man, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. His money was very important to him and too much to give up. And now we're back to the verses we started at. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So again, I ask, does wealth keep us from God? Let me suggest three answers. One, yes, if it causes us to become proud. This is one of the guardrails Jesus suggested last week. Watch out for pride. If wealth causes us to feel proud of our accomplishments and think, you know, I don't need God so much. I've got plenty of money to take care of myself. Then it does keep us from God. Maybe the writer Thomas Carlyle understood Jesus' words when he wrote, Adversity is hard on a man. But for one man who can withstand prosperity, there are a hundred who can stand adversity. It's difficult to become prosperous and not become proud. The wife of a lottery winner who won $314.9 million said she uh, regrets that her husband ever bought the ticket. It pushed them into the limelight and suddenly friends and neighbors came out of nowhere asking for money. And they got a sense of ease, like, you know, we're set for life and we got it made now. You know, within a few years, they'd blown through all of it. And she told the Charlotte Gazette, she said, I wish I'd torn up that ticket. I wish she'd given it to me. Deuteronomy says, this is uh, God telling the people of Israel as they went into the promised land, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God 
his laws and his decrees that I'm giving you today. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, you build fine houses and settle down. When your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increases and all is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. If wealth causes us to feel proud, it keeps us from God. Two, yes, wealth can keep us from God if it becomes an addiction. Jesus discovered that wealth was extremely important to this man. He was addicted to it. He had become so attached to it that he could not accept Jesus' offer of eternal life. That's a danger with money. What we once used to get by, to live on, now we can't live without. Our stuff becomes too important to us. Almost every year we read of brush fires in Southern California. And they come up to houses that are built out in the hills. And, and one year there was a fire was coming toward this neighborhood and, and they, the family jammed their SUV with everything they wanted to take. They just barely had enough room to squeeze the kids in. So they squeezed the kids in at the last minute. Dad sits down to start the car and wouldn't you know he can't find his keys. So they all get out and look for the keys everywhere and they can't find them. Eventually they just have to, you know, flee. They came back a couple days later. Their house was burned all the way down to the foundation and their car was melted down to the cement. Another man in the same neighborhood saw the fire coming and he quickly wrote out a list of all the things he didn't want to leave. The fire came so fast, all he got away with was the list. You say, well, I don't have this problem. I am not addicted to things, to money. Well, one way to assess if you have an addiction to money, it might be to look at your level of debt. A debt is reaching into the future and grabbing something you really can't afford and putting it on credit. Exceptions to this avoid debt at all cost uh, advice might be a mortgage for a house and paying for an education, presumably because a house is rising in value and Hopefully, education will pay for itself. But even those two need to be kept to a minimum. To tame the addiction to money, uh, we have to go back to the Bible's teaching on saving. The Bible suggests that you ought to save. So you should save up before you buy so you don't have to put it on credit. In 1974, Americans saved on average 13% of what they earned. Last year, we saved only 4%. And before the recession in 2007, Americans were saving only 1%. Last summer, I read for the first time The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. It sold over 4 million copies. He has several other books that have sold uh, well over a million copies. I thought his principles for saving and getting out of debt uh, were worth repeating. So number one, he says, make a budget. Uh, he says, by making a budget, you can save 33% immediately. By knowing what you're spending, where it's going, you can immediately save 33% of your spending. Two, establish a $1,000 cash reserve. Uh, if you're constantly getting dinged in your uh, bank account for overdraft fees and uh, buying things that you really can't afford, putting it on credit, you know, that's, that's just an expensive way to live. And he's, he says, build up a $1,000 cash reserve. If you, if you spend some of it down, then fill it back up again. Three, he says, uh, establish a three to six month rainy day fund. That's for in case you lose your job or something terrible happens to the house or a car goes out or big medical expense. If you, if you pay it down, then fill it back up again. Then you don't have to live on this constant edge of stress. Uh, four, pay off all no non-mortgage debt. He says, start with the smaller ones. Maybe you have a little account with Nordstrom or Home Depot. Get rid of those first. It gives you a feeling of momentum. And then go up to the larger ones until you've got all your credit cards paid off. Then he says put 15% per year into retirement. Uh, maybe you have a company that does a 3% match, so you put in 12%, they put in 3%. Then he says pay off your mortgage, and if you have it, a line of credit. And then once you've paid all of that off, then he says you can begin to invest. By learning to save, you're practicing the biblical principle of delayed gratification. You're observing the guardrail we talked about last week. Avoid greed. You're not allowing wealth to become an addiction. Three, yes, wealth keeps us from God if it distracts us from making God our first priority. 
If all of our time is is spent taking care of our stuff, our properties, our investments, and we don't have any time to develop a relationship with Jesus, then our wealth keeps us from God. That's why Jesus asked the young man to sell all that he had. Charlie Shedd wrote a book called And God Made Grandparents, and it was good. He tells about a guy who had white hair. He was the paragon of grace and excellence. He had everything money could buy. All was going well to him until the day his grandson told him off. His grandson came to meet with him and he said, Thanks for the job offer, Gramps, but I've decided to take the teaching job. His grandfather says, What? You can't make any money working with special needs kids. In the bank, we've got good salaries, benefits, and promotions. I'll see to it personally that you get a promotion. That's when his grandson let him have it. He said, Gramps, 73 years, and all you've got to offer for it is money. Pathetic. Well, that day, his world just kind of caved in on him. He was standing with Charlie Shedd out in their garden and looking at the perfectly manicured roses that the gardener had done, looking back at the pool and then the beautiful house. and Everything he had was the best, but he wasn't feeling the best that day. He began to wonder, do do his other grandkids feel the same way about him? How about his kids? Do they feel the same way? How about his wife? What can you say to a guy that is feeling devastated by his grandson? I guess there's only one word, the, the word his grandson used. Pathetic. If your money keeps you from God, it's pathetic. So I want to ask the second question. Is it possible to be rich and be a devoted follower of Christ? You say, what a crazy question. Why would you even ask such a question? There are all these verses in the Bible that if you give to God, then he'll bless you. Well, I asked the question because Jesus asked the question in 1825. Or said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. What does Jesus mean? Does he mean you can't be rich and a devoted follower of Christ? I say you can be rich and a devoted follower of Christ if you depend on God and remember that he owns it all. So consider this another one of Jesus' guardrails concerning money. Depend on God, not on money, and remember that he owns it all. People were shocked when Jesus said it's difficult for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? I mean, rich people, the, Jew, the Jewish people thought that those were people that were blessed by God. So if those people can't be saved, then who can? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Jesus says it's difficult for rich people to enter the kingdom of God, but anything is possible with God. God can change hearts. He can turn priorities. Peter said to him, we left all we had to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come. So we don't want to build a theology that says wealth is bad. Jesus says no one gives up anything for him without him giving back many times over. Jesus didn't ask this man to sell all because he wants all of us to become poor. He loves to bless us. He just realized God wasn't first in this man's life. His money was first. God insists on being first. He wants our whole heart. But once he has it, he's happy to give back to us. So it's possible to be rich and be devoted to Christ if we keep a loose grip on our money. We have to be willing to let God, let go and give back to God whenever he asks. The man in the parable was not willing. I think the best barometer of how loose a grip we keep on our giving, uh, on our money, is to look at our giving. Jesus suggests we give back to God the first tenth of our income. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. He says, that's good. It's good that you're tithing, 
but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. He says, it's good that you tithe, but you should also show mercy. Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's a promise. Loosen your grip on your money and give to God. It's an adventure in watching God supernaturally provide. You give and then you trust God to take care of your needs. You say, God, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay all my bills, but I'm going to trust you that he'll meet your needs and even bless you. Common response I hear is, I can't tithe. I've got so many bills, so many debts. I don't, I don't think I'd make it if I tithe. Well, typically what I ask them in response is, if your income was decreased by 10% right now, would you go bankrupt? They usually answer no. I said, well, then you've just admitted you can tithe. You just are scared to do so. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's a challenge. Seek first his kingdom. That's the challenge. And in the promise. And all these things will be added to you as well. Giving them becomes an adventure in faith. If we let go and give back to God the first tenth of all that we earn, God promises to make our finances stretch. As we learn the liberty of letting God, letting go to God in this area of finances, God will make it His mission to rebuke the oppressive forces that chew up our finances. God doesn't promise that we'll never have a furnace go out or an oven quit. But if we depart from the Lord's ways or neglect His life-nourishing principles by choosing not to tithe, we step out from under God's umbrella of blessing. Without His protection, you and I are far more vulnerable to life's reign of problems. Tithing then becomes an adventure in obedience to God and watching Him supernaturally provide. Who in His right mind would want to miss out on God being supernaturally involved in blessing and protecting their finances. When a person says, I can't possibly afford to tithe right now, they usually mean their income is small and their debts are large. But often I hear the same argument from people that, that have very good income. They just reverse the argument. They say, if I were to give 10% of all that I earn, you realize how much that would be? I can't possibly afford to give that much money away. Teenagers sometimes use the same argument. I can't afford to tithe because I really don't have any income. But once I get out of college and get a real job, then I'll begin. I don't think that's really good thinking. You know, I grew up in a home where my parents taught me to tithe as a young boy. I, uh, allowance. Every time I get allowance, first 10% would go to God. Then when I got my first job in high school, get my paycheck, first 10th went to God. I continued that prog uh, uh, pro you know, way of living when I got to college and graduate school. I worked all through college and graduate school. First 10% of any check I received went to God. Now, let me tell you, that was hard to do because I had high expenses. Now, my parents paid half of college and graduate school, but I was responsible for the other half. I needed every penny. But I think God blessed me because I gave to him faithfully. And you know what? I got out of college and graduate school debt-free. So I think young people need to begin when they're young. This practice of giving back to God the first tenth. The decision to tithe or give God a percentage of your income all comes down to faith and trust in Christ's promises. Do you believe Jesus' promise? That if you give a generous percentage of your income to God, that he will take care of you and give back to you. God insists on being first in our lives. Jesus checked with the rich young man to see if he was first by asking him to sell all that he had and then follow him. He checks with us to see if he's first in our lives by asking us to keep a loose grip on our money and being willing to give generously to him. Would you like to step out in faith today? I want to invite you to take our three-month tithe challenge 
I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a few minutes, but you can do it online. You just go to our website, portlandcommunitychurch.org. You get there and you click on Give Online. So we embrace irrational generosity. Uh, we know it changes lives, both ours and the people we're reaching. Uh, at Portland Community Church, taking action is, on generosity is very simple. The Bible teaches the baseline standard for giving is the tithe. When we give the first tenth of our income to the church, we put God first. Uh, the three-month tithe challenge can help you get started. So you select. Take the three-month tithe challenge. It's based on Malachi 3, 10, and 11. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Pour out so much blessing, there will not be room for enough of it. There's the test. Give him the tithe. And there's the promise. I'll pour out so much blessing you won't be able to handle it. And he goes on. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. I will take care of you. Do you believe me? Then take the three-month tithe challenge. Here it is. If you tithe for three months and God doesn't hold true to his promises of blessings, we will refund 100% of your tithe. We believe so strongly in Jesus' promises that he always does what he says he will do. We believe you will never be sorry if you begin this practice. Now, some of you are looking at the tithe like that's a big gulp. So I'll make you another deal. Start somewhere. If you're not giving, you start somewhere. Maybe it's 2%. Maybe it's 4%. But Jesus' promise is always the same. Give and it will be given back to you. So whatever percentage you choose. I'm not going to make you the money back guarantee uh, 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 at a lower level. But any level is a start. And I encourage you all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your teaching about money and this rich man and what you told him and what you tell us, that you want to be first in our lives. And we want to show you that you're first in our lives, and one way might be by our giving. So I want to give you an opportunity right now to uh, respond to God, tell him what you heard today. And uh, if, if you want to tell him, I want to make you first in my life, and maybe one of the ways is to loosen my grip on my money, and I want to take this three-month tithe challenge, you tell him that right now. Or maybe it's another, another percentage. You tell him right now. You pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing our prayers. And Lord, uh, commitments that have to do with money, they just require a lot of trust and faith. Give us trust and faith in you and your promises. In Jesus' name, amen.